Hi, thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Max Harper. I'm a research scientist at Group Lens Research at the University of Minnesota. We're a research lab that does social computing work. Uh, I'm here to describe a paper called Putting Users in Control of Their Recommendations that I wrote in collaboration with other members of Group Lens. In this talk, I'm going to describe three things. First, a problem. If we get bad recommendations from a system, it's hard to know what to do to make them better. Nearly all recommender systems are black boxes where we provide our behavior, we provide lists, we provide liking activity. Uh, if we don't know how to act to make things better, then uh, that's a problem, and I'd like to address that in this talk. Two, the opportunity to address that problem. Uh, the approach that I'm going to discuss is to add user control to the recommender. We built a prototype system in MovieLens, which is a movie recommendation system, that lets people explicitly control the behavior of the recommender using simple uh, expressions like more popular or newer. And we show them immediately the impact of their choices on the resulting recommendations. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is a user study of this prototype system, uh, where we ask the question, do the user controls help? We deployed a blinded version of this system and asked, are users happier after they've uh, tuned their recommendations? And there are two takeaway messages from this talk. The first message is that users actually use this technology in very different ways. So we see examples of users who don't want to tune their recommendations at all, and we see users who want to tune them a lot. And the other takeaway message is that users self-reported as being much happier with the recommendations after they tuned them. Okay, so let's start with discussing the problem a bit more. So <laughs> recommender systems are black boxes. Um, and let's start with the assumption that, in general, we're interested in getting really great recommendations from the systems that we use. In pursuit of this goal, we provide recommenders with our data. And we provide this data honestly. We rate things honestly. We browse the things we actually like. And the reason for that is that we want the recommender to work for us. And so we might be curious about how the recommender algorithms will use our data, but ultimately we're uncertain about how those actions will impact the results. And systems like this, where we understand the inputs, we understand the outputs, but we don't understand what happens in the middle, these are known as black boxes. And I believe that most recommenders are black boxes to users. And this is a problem, because if the recommender isn't working, then we don't know how to make things better when they go wrong. Okay, so let's ground this theory in my own personal reality of bad recommendations, looking at two systems, or uh, two groups of systems, movie systems and music systems. So in Netflix, I manage four profiles, and one of them's for me. It's my special profile. I uh, consume and rate content that I really enjoy for me, and that content tends to involve big explosions, car chases, and lots of kicking. <laughs> Once, I accidentally uh, facilitated my daughter watching an episode of Dora the Explorer using this profile. And Dora is a pretty decent kids show. But in one fell stroke, I irre irrevocably broke my recommendations. Suddenly, there's children's content everywhere. My top end list now has the penguins of Madagascar. And so this recommender just broke. I have different problems in the music world. Spotify, where I've donated about 5,000 hours of listening data, somehow believes that I have extremely obscure taste in music. I use their Discover feature, and I haven't heard of any of the music that they recommend to me, and that's just not good enough to keep me engaged in the system. Pandora has the other problem. When I create new playlists in Pandora, I'm familiar with everything that they have. Hey, Spotify, turn down the popularity. And Pandora, I'd like, I'm sorry, Spotify, please turn it up. Pandora, please turn it down. I wish I had those knobs, and I don't. Uh, so I'd argue that this problem is just not my problem. It's a problem that's shared with lots of people. And uh, one source of evidence that I have for this is I'm a software developer and community manager for MovieLens, a movie recommendation system. It operates on the simplest of recommendation premises where you rate movies using a five-star scale, and you get recommendations back to you based on that data. Our users tell us all the time about how our recommender works for them or how it doesn't work for them. So let's look at some of the things that they say. Don't recommend me cartoon, anime, animation. I'm too old for that kind of stuff. Wish I could rate actors. I hate poor acting. I very rarely watch movies in languages other than English, Spanish, or Portuguese. However, over half of my top picks are pictures in other languages. 
I'm rarely going to be in the mood to watch foreign films from before 1970. Uh, so these users are expressing the ways that they think about how the recommender could work well for them, and unfortunately, none of them have anything to do with how MovieLens actually provides movie recommendations, which is using five-star ratings. Our item-item collaborative filtering algorithm, unfortunately, does not have knobs with these labels that, that we can adjust. But what if we could create those knobs and let users play with them? That's an opportunity, and that's the one I'm gonna discuss now. So we're certainly not the first people to explore the idea of giving users direct control over their recommendations. To better frame our contribution, let me start by discussing several related systems from industry and from academia. Many commercial systems provide some form of explicit user control. Goodreads, in addition to giving me some tips on how to rate content and, and say when I have bad recommendations, they let me create um, genre or content-based searches. And so even if the recommender really doesn't understand me, at least I can fall back on these uh, narrower recommenders that show me only the types of content that I'm interested right, in right then. Netflix offers an extremely extensive uh, array of surveys that let me pick how often I consume different types of content. For example, I watch dark comedies very often. Facebook allows you to mark some friends as close friends, other friends as acquaintances in uh, an effort to allow you to prioritize the content from those closer friends and to de-emphasize content from the other sources. And Amazon shows you the content that you've purchased and consumed and lets you hide it from your recommender profile. Our work is inspired by all of these examples that put control in the hands of users. The research world has also explored providing user controls. Uh, Critiquing-based recommenders have a pretty long history in this field. They've been around since at least the early 2000s. And I think of these systems as a sort of hybrid recommendation and search process, um, where the user takes a set of recommendations and is able to express a simple but powerful concept to that set of recommendations, like less expensive, and then they get a different, uh, more refined set back. And we build on this simple and understandable expressive power of statements like more, uh, less expensive, thinner camera, things like that. The taste weight system that came from Rexus a few years ago um, is a really neat system. It provides a graphical flow diagram of your recommender system. And in a sense, it's, it's really trying to be a white box recommender or a transparent recommender. It reveals how things work for you. So it's cool because it lets you drag around the weights of these different inputs. Um, and you immediately get to see the changes that the recommender makes in the resulting uh, top end list that's shown on the right side of the screen. And we build on that idea that users can benefit from immediately seeing the changes as they happen. So our method is based on three principles which in combination distinguish it from other systems. So first, there are some really great recommender algorithms out there, uh, whether it's collaborative filtering algorithms, machine learning algorithms, learning to rank, um, let's not throw those algorithms out because they do good things. Let's build on top of them and extend them. The second principle is that we immediately show the user how their changes affect the resulting recommendations so that the user can determine if those recommendations are better or worse. And third, let users express a simple more or less preference. Uh, so for example, if the recommender is showing too many obscure items, let them express a preference such as make it more popular. So let's start with the method of building on top of existing algorithms. So to show you the idea of our algorithm, let me walk you through an example. Imagine that we have a movie le recommender, much like MovieLens, that uses some collaborative filtering algorithm to create personalized star rating predictions for each user. We want to extend this recommender to give users control over the popularity of their recommendations. In this table, we show the user's top three recommendations, uh, based on sorted by predicting rating, and that's basically how MovieLens works today. Uh, the first movie you'll notice is pretty obscure, it only has 100 ratings, and then these movies uh, grow in popularity, so that movie two is uh, sort of a mix between obscure and popular, and movie three, let's say in our system, is extremely popular, one of the most popular movies. So we'd like to combine these factors, um, and in support of that, we first uh, transform the data by using a, a flattening technique, um, which is converting each factor to a percentile. 
And then, with these flattened distributions, we can then easily combine them using our variant of an ensemble recommender. So the twist that we provide to an ensemble recommender is that we let users control the weights on the different factors. So imagine that the system default might have um, a weight on the predicted rating at 100% and the weight on popularity to 0%. In this way, uh, we actually don't consider the popularity at all in making our recommendations and, and we still support the default recommender behavior. But say, uh, imagine that the user discovers that it's possible to turn up the popularity. The user clicks more popular and the system adjusts the weights to 90% predicted rating and 10% popularity. Uh, as a result of this action, the order of the three movies is actually reversed. And in the context of a larger database of movies, movie one and movie two would likely drop out of this top three list, far down into the list. And so you can see how the small change might make a, a big difference to the, the top end list of a user's recommendations. And movie lens actually works a lot like this. Users' top picks are by default sorted by predicted rating. And those picks are really a mix of obscure titles and popular titles. And so using our ensemble method, blending in small amounts of popularity actually causes quite significant impacts to the resulting uh, ordering and contents of users' top end lists. Our paper contains an analysis of the impact of uh, these global effects of blending in popularity and another variable age. Um, and so if you're interested in those global impacts, you should check out that paper. So returning to the idea that this method can be uh, used to complement really any recommender technology that orders items, um, the example that I walked through combined predicted rating and popularity, but there's a generic formulation too where you combine the output of any existing ranking-based recommender with an arbitrary number of other features. The challenge, of course, is making these, users under making these features understandable to the users in the user interface. So let's turn to that a little bit. Um, we'd like to uh, provide a user interface so that users can actually understand how their choices affect their recommendations. In this work, we make the assumption that the user can evaluate the quality of a recommender by examining the properties of the top N list of not yet consumed content. So even if we make this assumption that users can evaluate the quality by looking at a top N list, a user interface challenge is in helping the user to determine their favorite setting in terms of that top end list. So the method we work with is roughly comparable to a procedure from the eye doctor where you ask if a new lens configuration is better or worse than the prior configuration. Our analogy is that we allow the user to make some change and they should be able to decide by looking at that change if they've made things better or worse. And how best should we support that decision? We experimented internally using an iterative design and feedback process to find an interface that works. And our task, which we were developing in support of the user study that I'll describe later, showed the user's top 24 list in a grid-like pattern, the top of which you can see here. And we started with the simplest solution. When you click more popular, you see a list of uh, your new recommendations. Turns out this interface is really bad. And uh, that's because uh, you haven't memorized the prior list. And because you haven't memorized the prior list and you can't remember it anymore, you don't know which movies were added, which were removed, and which things were reordered. So the first step in improving it, uh, we highlighted the movies that were added, and that helped, but we still uh, didn't know which movies were dropped from the resulting list. And so we ended up with uh, an additional UI component that shows the user which movies were added and which movies were removed then the user can decide if the things in the added list are better or worse than the things in the removed list. And that can serve as the basis for deciding if the recommendation it's itself has been optimized. A third principle of our approach is to allow simple adjustments to the recommender. And uh, that's actually harder than it sounds. Um, so whether you want to give the user a slider widget or some sort of simulated knob or a more button and a less button, um, we probably want to use discrete weights um, because if you turn up the popularity, for example, too little, then you won't see any change and that's unsatisfying. Um, so our initial thought on how to build these increments for the user so that there's um, some perceivable change, the list looks different, but not too different, um, we thought, uh, that perhaps we could come up with a global set of increments that seem to work well across a variety of users, and it turns out we couldn't. Um, it turns out when it, which, uh, 
No matter which parameters we chose for these increments, some users would see no change when they clicked the button, and some users would see their entire list swapped out when they clicked the button. So we shifted to another option that, um, that worked for us, and that's a, a flexible increment where we aim to change some number of the top end list. In our case, we had a list of 24 items. We decided to swap out about 20% of them, or four of them. That felt like a, a cognitively feasible number. Um, and this technique worked for us, but it was computationally expensive but because we had to pre-compute these increments for each user, which required building lots of recommenders and seeing how they change from increment to increment. So the last part of this talk concerns the methods and results from a user study that we ran to determine the potential for this user-controlled recommender system. We picked two features to experiment with that we believed uh, might be interesting to learn from in a variety, and useful in a variety of situations. So thinking of how systems like e-commerce sites and blogs order content, we decided to look at popularity and recency, or age, as our two factors. So if you think of browsing e-commerce sites and blogs, you can often order the content by popularity to see the most popular stuff, and you often order by recency to see the newest stuff. Well, maybe that's actually, those are useful parameters in making a recommender better. To study our system, we employed an online lab study built on top of the MovieLens system. The basic structure was this. First, complete a task where we ask you to use our recommender interface. Then answer a bunch of questions about your original list, your adjusted list, and um, the quality of the interface itself. To recruit participants, we emailed users who had, been, who had logged in during the previous six months, who had rated at least 15 things, and who had consented to participate in MovieLens experiments. Um, and we assigned subjects to, randomly to two variables. The first variable is whether they saw a popularity control or an age control, though we blinded the subjects to the nature of these controls. And the second variable is one that randomly ordered the surveys. And because we did not see any order effect in responses to the surveys, I'm not going to talk about that any further. So we asked users, um, we gave users the instructions to click buttons labeled left, right, and reset until they found their favorite list of recommendations. When they enter the task, item-item collaborative filtering is set to 100%, and the other factor, whether it be popularity or age, depending on their experimental condition, is 0%. We call this the origin, and users could return to the origin at any time by clicking reset. As the user travels farther right from the origin, the list is biased more towards popular or newer movies, again, depending on their condition. And as the user travels farther left of the origin, the list is biased more towards obscure or older movies. The weights on these factors could actually take on negative values. And notice that the buttons are left and right rather than more popular and less popular. In this trial, we wish to learn about participants' preferences concerning recommendation without cognitively biasing their actions or responses. And that's the rationale for that decision. Here's a screenshot of the task interface, combining the task descriptions, uh, the controls, and the interface for displaying the changing recommendations. After the participant clicked, I'm done, we asked them to complete three short surveys, as I discussed before, evaluate the original list, evaluate the tuned list, and evaluate the tool itself. Let me show you what we learned. I'm only going to discuss one of the two sets of results for the sake of time. I'm gonna talk about popularity. The age results are in the paper. Our first major takeaway is this. Participants used the feature in very different ways. On this chart, we show a histogram of the number of left-right steps taken away from the original configuration. Recall that each step uh, involves a change of four movies from the original list. Therefore, participants with six or more steps from the origin had swapped out all 24 of their original recommendations using this interface. Quite a few users actually wound up to the left of the origin. These users wanted the MovieLens recommender to be more obscure. Uh, but in general, we might say that MovieLens uh, skews towards the obscure side, since more people tuned their picks towards uh, popularity than towards obscurity. Um, and in general, we see that this distribution is evidence that users want to adjust their recommenders in very different ways. Our next result stems from a question asking users to evaluate their recommendations in terms of uh, popularity or obscurity. We gave the participants a statement. The movies in my top picks are 
They responded on a five point scale where the leftmost point was labeled too obscure, the rightmost point was labeled too popular, and the middle point was labeled just right, and that's in, in yellow on this chart. Uh, in this visualization, we compare the participants' aggregate responses to this question in their original picks on the top to their popularity adjusted picks on the bottom. And we can see that many more participants responded that their adjusted picks were just right in terms of popularity, 49% versus 31%. Participants also reported that their adjusted lists better represent their preferences. In this question, we asked users to compare their original list with their adjusted list using a standard Likert agree disagree response with the statement, the movies in this list accurately represent my preferences. Again, we compare aggregate responses from the original list on the top to the adjusted list on the bottom. But this time, agree statements are good. We want to see more responses on the right side of the scale, which we did. Adjusting popularity raised the number of agree or strongly, disagree, strongly agree responses from 21% to 50%. We also asked users if they found the recommendations helpful for finding movies to watch, which is the purpose of using MovieLens. This list would help me find movies I would enjoy watching. This time, the percentage of agrees and strongly agrees rose from 26% to 61%, which is great. So um, we've collected a bunch of evidence that users were happier when they were able to control the popularity and age of their top picks. And some folks, of course, would be interested in automating this process, predict users' settings, and just apply them. And that's an interesting idea. So, I mean, after all, this preference is something that, you could, be, that could be inferred from the data. Um, and we have a training set. So I think this is cool, but I'd just like to state why I think it's even cooler to give users control over the recommender. So the motivating idea for this work is in fixing a bad recommender. So what if you use machine learning to figure out how much popularity the user wants? Well, if, it, if that method fails and the user is left with bad recommendations, then again, they're in this state where they don't have control. They can't fix their bad recommendations. And also, it's worth considering the possibility that users simply like to have control or the possibility that a user setting one day uh, might be different from the next day. And uh, as it turns out, the next two speakers will address those points in subsequent talks. So in summary, we built and studied a user-adjusted recommender. And in particular, this recommender can be used to complement any existing recommender that orders items. Uh, in a study of how users change their recommender setting, settings, we found evidence that different users wish to push the recommender in different directions. And then on average, users were happier with the resulting recommendations than they were uh, with the original recommendations. With that, I conclude, and I welcome your questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Max, for your uh, talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. OK, it's a question. Yeah, so the suggestion is that perhaps we could give users controls that don't actually make the lists move in the specified direction, but that we could order them randomly, or perhaps in some more intelligent fashion, just change them. And I think that's a good idea. Uh, that's obviously future work. We didn't do that in this experiment. And it's interesting because still unanswered is the question, do users actually prefer the adjusted lists? Or do they just like the idea that they're given control? And we don't know the answer to that. Maybe a follow-up yeah. remark to this. Uh, I know there's a study very old where they're uh, um, trying to get a head in line. And once they just did it without saying anything, the second time they give it a reason, and uh, there are two different uh, conditions where they can take the reason as well. So we should just tell them random things and they'll be just as happy. <laughs> uh, there is a question, Slomo. Yeah, right. 
Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering if the users feel like they need to tune their recommender. Could you speak up, please? Yes, I, I, I was wondering if the users feel like they need to tune their recommender. If they need to what? To tune it. Okay, so I have a slide that I skipped that uh, talks about that more or less. So we asked users if um, they want control over the system. And so one way of getting at that is asking them, if we built this into MovieLens, would you use it? Um, we asked them on a Likert scale of I would never use it to I would often use it. Um, turns out that 89% of our users said they would use a feature like this um, if we had it. Now, uh, take that with a grain of salt. Our experimental study uh, based on our recruitment methods, which is email, biases our sample towards more, pop, more power users. So uh, it's more likely that a passionate user of MovieLens is going to respond to an email than someone who doesn't like the system. And so um, if 90% of those users want control, then that's a good signal to us that this is actually useful. Um, on the other hand, we don't know if the average user wants it or not. So it, it, Again, this is an unanswered question. This could be a thing that only power users want, people who really want to invest time and energy in making their profiles better. I would count myself among those users in a variety of systems. Uh, other users just you know, want, as they talked about in the tutorial earlier, the, the lean back experience. They don't want any involvement. And controls like this would be superfluous to them. Hi, my question is, uh, are these recommendations batch-based models or are they like real-time recommendations that you're suggesting? Uh, are, do, do these controls worsen the accuracy metrics? Uh, no, my question is uh, the recommendation model, the way you are uh, suggesting to alter the recommendation based on the user's signal, right, in terms of fine-tuning popularity or age. Is this more like a real-time approach that you're talking about or is it like you're saying this can be implemented in a batch level. What are you talking about here? I'm sorry, I, I could not take the answer. So are you suggesting that this approach can be applied to a batch-based recommendation model? Or is it for like real time where you just like kind of already pick your candidates but just reorder them or apply some logic there? Well, it could be a, uh, extended to a batch-based recommendation model. Yes, of course. Um, the thing is that the batch process would then have to account for whatever tunings you wished to apply. Uh, and so that might uh, scale your batch process greatly. So instead of simply pre-computing the one true recommendation model, uh, you might be pre-computing uh, that one and all of the possible ones that the user could select. So our approach, um, so MovieLens is built on sort of a, a, a batch-based model. We have a nightly build process where we do the hard parts of the recommender. Um, basically finding item-item item correlations. Um, and we're able to extend that process uh, in, without changing the computational complexity of the process. And the reason is that the factors that we've chosen, popularity and age, are both item-specific and not user-specific. And so we can actually compute those things um, just once for each item. And then uh, it's kind of trivial to extend the recommendation as a linear blend of the hard thing to compute, which is the personalized rating with these non-personalized features. We have time for one more quick question. Oh, okay, I would just to ask uh, whether you think that your uh, framework could be a extend it also to include other personalization variables such as diversity, for example? Uh, yes. So uh, the question is whether the user could control diversity or not. Um, so I should say an ensemble methods work um, across lots of combinations of variables. So uh, in our formulation, we've got one personalized variable and a bunch of features. Uh, you could imagine more than one personalized variable. Um, and you could imagine putting user controls on any of those things or not putting user controls on any of those things. And it would basically work the same. And I think the idea of making diversity one of those things that you could control would be really interesting. Um, the challenge in MovieLens is that we really decided to configure the recommender itself. And so this is a, a thing that persists. The recommender persists across a variety of searches and use cases. It's not just one particular search or set of items. 
And so that, you know, this is spanning tens of thousands of items. And so um, configuring the diversity uh, is actually a difficult proposition in that case. Um, but say you're changing instead to a task where, well, here are your 24 top picks and you're only adjusting that thing, then it becomes a little bit more tractable to explain and to implement a thing that uh, tweaks the diversity of that set of items. So, interesting okay. ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, as you said, I'm Michael Ekstrand at Texas State University. And I'm going to be talking about letting users uh, choose the recommender algorithms. And this is work that I did in conjunction with uh, folks at Group Lens, particularly Dan Kluver, Max Harper, and Joe Constan. So uh, my pa this paper is about this menu. Um, some, some of you will know the work of, of Bart Kneinenberg, and he did a paper once on uh, four radio buttons. And this is also a paper on four radio buttons. So, and what users do with four radio buttons. Our goal with this question is to basically look at, or this paper is to look at the question, if we give users control over the algorithm providing the recommendations, what happens? At a high level, it's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but first, why do we care about user control? And different people working on this will probably have different answers. Uh, I've written a little bit about this too on, on, uh, on a blog post if you want a little more of my thinking, but the reasons I'm, some of the reasons I'm particularly interested in user control is first, different users have different needs and wants from the system. And ideally, we might be able to think of building a recommender that can understand those needs and recommend the right things to the users. But uh, we oftentimes don't have either the data or necessarily the recommender engineering to support that yet. We have a bunch of different approaches that have different capabilities. So as step one, let's let the users pick which one they want. We can then mine the data that we get from them doing that to try to train a meta recommender down the road, but that's one the hopeful outcome of being able to do this kind of work. And another one is transparency and promoting trust in the recommender system. And for various reasons, this comes up in the news sometimes and things, people have some concerns about recommenders in different contexts. Maybe they don't want to be filter bubbled. Maybe they have concerns about tracking or concerns about being manipulated with perhaps persuasive computing of questionable ethics. Well, one potential approach to encouraging users' trust is by giving them some control, and if the system seems responsive to their controls, maybe they'll trust it more. This paper does not provide empirical support for either of those conclusions, but there's some of the ideas that motivate why we care about this question in the first place. So we have uh, four specific research questions that we're gonna look at in this talk. Um, if you're following along in the paper, the order is, the presentation framing of these is slightly different in the paper, but it's the same basic ideas. Uh, first, do users use the switching pay feature? And if so, how much do they use it and how do they use it? Then what algorithms do they tend to settle on? And do properties, either of the recommendations or of the users, predict their uh, preferences? And the really short answer are uh, yes, uh, a little bit and then they leave it alone. They prefer personalized algorithms with a slight preference for SVD and not yet that we've been able to figure out. Uh, relating this to some of the previous work, so uh, the paper Max just presented looked at tweaking the algorithm output, so applying additional layers to take the algorithm output and reorder it with popularity, with age. Um, we're changing the whole algorithm. So the, the, the two works could be combined if you swap out the base algorithm and then you apply some tweaks and tunings on top of it. Uh, also, uh, we had a paper last year at Rexis where we asked users what they perceive differences to be and what algorithms they want to use. And basically, we can, um, that was looking at what users say they want when you ask them. And this work is looking at what do users' actions say that they want. And are these the same? Are these different? What can we learn from comparing these, uh, these things? So the remainder of this talk, I just went through the introduction, uh, but I'm going to explain the experimental setup, walk through some of our key findings, and then talk about what all this means. So the context is in the Movie Lens Recommender platform, in the new Movie Lens that recently went from beta to not beta. And this, the experiment basically launched with a switch over to not beta and added a feature that users can switch the algorithm that they use, uh, that MovieLens uses. 
And the algorithm, as Max said, the algorithm or the recommender is used pervasively in, in movie lens. It provides recommendations whenever you're sorting by, by, by predicted rating or by recommendation. Then uh, it also provides predictions pervasively throughout, uh, throughout the system and is involved in a lot of your aspects of, of movie lens interaction. Uh, the change of what algorithm you, you pick is persistent until your next tweak. So basically, you always have this menu. You can pick which algorithm, and then that algorithm's used throughout the rest of your interactions until you decide to pick a different one. And then the switcher is integrated into the top menu. So we've got the movie lens interface. There's this menu at the top. You pull that down, and you get this recommender switcher. This is what it looks like now. The user interface has been updated a little bit from when we ran the study. So... We ran four algorithms for this. The first one is, and we, or we gave them names that are not really descriptive of what the algorithm does for the most part, but are kind of memorable and a little bit, have a little character. So um, the peasant algorithm is a personalized user item mean, uh, so for ranking purposes, it's just using average rating. Um, and it is, uh, and we just explained that as non-personalized. The Bard is a group-based recommender uh, that was uh, published um, by Stephen Chang from the Group Lens Group and, and uh, co-authors. And the, uh, that one we just explained is based on groups. Or, and then the Warrior and the Wizard are two collaborative filters, item-item and SV collaborative filtering, respectively. Each algorithm was modified with a 10% blend of popularity. Uh, that's, that was the, uh, the default that we put into movie lens based on uh, internal testing to see the, the uh, effects of excessive novelty as well as the results we saw in the user study we published last year where novel, excessive novelty caused problems for users. Uh, and then the, this is what the menu, um, the menu looked like this as I showed you, and the users could just pick which algorithm they wanted. The BARD required some additional setup. Uh, they had to to rate groups of movies, and so it was grayed out unless they had done that setup. So for the experimental design, uh, we only considered established users. So if a user came and they signed up for a new movie lens account, we didn't, we didn't use them because we wanted users who had rating profiles already. Each user was randomly assigned to an initial algorithm, not the BARD. No user was assigned the BARD initially because you have to do the extra setup, and that was part of a, a new user uh, process. Then um, we allowed the users to change algorithms and we logged the interactions. When they first logged into the new system, there was a brief interstitial that showed them, hey, there's this new feature, here's how you get to it. So they knew it was there and knew they could go play with it. And then we did this, this study does not have any uh, user questionnaire or, or, or that kind of uh, direct surveying of the users. It's totally based on the logs of what users actually did with the tool. We had 3,005 total users that we considered. Um, and we also, or one more note on the, the initial assignment. Users who were in our user study for the, the last year's paper and picked either of the algorithms that we kept in the final system for their choice, they got that algorithm, but we didn't consider them for this study because it wasn't a random initial condition. So these are only the users that got the random initial condition. Either they picked an algorithm that we didn't keep, user, user, or uh, they weren't in the study, the previous study. So we have uh, 3,005 total users. Of these, 25% used the control. So not even the majority used it, but 25% of our users experimented with the control. And of the people who experimented with the control, 72% in the end picked a different algorithm than they started with. So finding number one, users did use this thing. Um, so how do they use it? How do they, do they switch a lot? Do they switch a little? Do they uh, use it repeatedly like they're different days, they're using different algorithms, or do they play with it and then leave it alone? And first, uh, they, they didn't switch the control a huge amount. Most users switched it less than five times. We did have one user that switched it like 7,000 times. Not entirely sure what they were doing, but they were clearly an outlier. Um, the other high use users were more like in the one to 200 range, but, uh, but most users five times. This, this shows the distribution of up to 19 times how many users were, were tweaking the knob how many times. 
Uh, we also wanted to look at, do they use it throughout their use or do they use it, where do they use it with respect to their use of the system? So we broke the user interactions with MovieLens into sessions. And so we considered a user to start a new session when they had been idle for, for 60 minutes. And just, you walk away from your computer, come back 60 minutes later, uh, and, and then you're in a new session. 63% of our users only ever used the control in one session. 81% only used it in two or fewer sessions. So most users didn't use it in a lot of different sessions. 44% um, only switched in the first session. And so basically, and also there are few intervening events. So like they would switch it and then they would do a page view or they would do, or basically they would switch it and they would do a page view or two and then they would switch it again if they did. Uh, you didn't have user, we did not see very many users switching it and then doing a bunch of browsing and then switching again. So it seemed like they basically played with it a little bit, either found the algorithm that suited them best or got bored and then left the control alone. So users use the menu some and then they leave it alone um, is, is our second finding there. So to get into what algorithms they prefer, we, wanted to, we looked at that a few different ways, a couple different ways. First, do some users find some algorithms more initially satisfactory than others? So basically, does the initial condition say you get the, the warrior recommender? Are people who start with the warrior more or less likely to try other recommenders? The idea being that if you're less likely, that means you find its recommendations more satisfactory. And uh, the baseline was the most likely to try other recommenders. The item, item, and the SVD were less likely. All the differences uh, between these three algorithms are statistically significant using a chi-squared test with uh, appropriate p-value. Um, but there, the, there is a, the difference between the baseline and the non-personalized, the users, or the, and the personalized, the users knew that it was non-personalized and it was personalized. So this is measuring both the recommendations and does the user want something that's called personalized? But uh, with that level of, of transparency and what's going on, the users did prefer the personalized algorithms and they preferred SVD a little bit more than item item. Then the next way we wanted to look at it was what do users settle on? After users play with the knob, are they more likely to pick one algorithm over another? And how do they get there? Um, do they, what, what do they do between their initial and their final algorithm? And the most common, so we looked at basically the sequence of algorithms, and you can find a table with, with exact percentages on this in the paper, but we looked at the sequence of algorithms that they went through, basically looking at the knob as, as a state transition. And what are the common, the most common state sequences? And the most common thing for them to do, uh, if they started in a personalized algorithm, was to go to the other personalized algorithm, and the next most common was to do that and then go back to their first personalized algorithm. So most users basically tried the two personalized algorithms. If they started in the baseline, the most likely was to try one or both personalized algorithms and then settle on one of those two. Um, there were users who had, a, who had all manner of more elaborate sequences, but the most common ones were basically try each of the algorithms, particularly the personalized algorithms, and then settle on the one that you thought you liked best. Um, the final choice of algorithms, uh, users overwhelmingly, when they did, and this is only of users who switched the control at least once, users overwhelmingly did finally pick one of the, uh, the personalized algorithms, and they did pick SVD more than item item, and a number of users did go activate the group based recommender and finally settle on that one. So users, we saw users preferring personalized algorithms uh, and bo both in whether they were likely to switch and um, when their final choice with a small preference of SVD over item item. And this result contrasts just a little bit with what we saw in the user study when we asked users which one do you prefer, there we could tell no difference. Basically they're dead even whether users preferred SVD or item item and in the behavioral use we see more users preferring SVD based, the SVD based recommender. 
With the caveat on these particular results that the naming and the, the transparency does affect them, particularly the non-personalized versus personalized, and even there, it may be that people think warriors are cool, or wizards are cooler than warriors. Um, it would be an interesting further study to you do one with randomized labels to try to, to see whether that, to get rid of that potential effect. Um, we also wanted to look at whether properties of the recommendations predicted what the user was gonna do. So we uh, ran an offline experiment with uh, the users that were in our study. So we, for each user, we threw away all the ratings they gave the system after they started the study. They, we took the last five ratings pre-study and treated those as our test ratings, and then we did a trained test evaluation on that, on that data set. And we measured uh, the RMSE of the test ratings. We measured a Boolean recall, which is just, it's recall, except we only, we just, it's one if the recommender recommended a movie the user rated in the first 24. We used 24 because that's the size of one page of movie lens results. So does it recommend a movie the user rated in the first page? We also looked at the diversity of the recommendations using interlist similarity over the tag genome, and then uh, the novelty using the mean popularity rank of, uh, of the recommendations. And the reason we use the Boolean recall is a lot of the algorithms, or a lot of the algorithm user pairs, didn't recommend any users, the, any movies the users rated. So measuring recall was really just measuring this little thing for about a third of the results. Measuring Boolean recall let us measure something meaningful over all users. So the algorithms did make different recommendations. So uh, we three algorithms per user, we didn't run the BARD for this, three algorithms per user. We looked at the number of unique recommend, movies recommended in those three 24 item recommendation lists. There was an average of 54 unique recommendations out of 72 possible 24 minimum. And so the, the recommenders were producing different results. Baseline and item item were the most different and Accuracy, the RMSC uh, baseline item item SVD, Boolean recall baseline SVD item item. Uh, so the item item was or the SVD was better in RMSC on these test ratings. The Boolean recall or the item item was better on Boolean recall. Then uh, the diversity was fairly similar across them. Uh, the Item item was slightly more diverse. And then popularity, um, SVD had the most novel recommendations. However, none of these properties were useful for predicting the user preference once we controlled for the algorithm's identity to capture all of the other behaviors of the algorithms. So we could not find, for example, users were more likely to switch away from a diverse list of recommendations. We found no such effects when we tried to train logistic models on these to predict, will the user try a different recommender? Um, none, of these, none of these properties were useful in making that kind of a prediction. Um, we also, we, in general, we found uh, nothing that we collected that was gonna really predict the user behavior. We just had to watch what they did. Basic user properties like the hit, their age, the diversity of their rating, or their account age, diversity of their ratings, number of ratings. Um, did not predict which algorithms they were gonna, going to prefer. And uh, we also, we found a few minor effects, like users are more likely to, uh, sw the users are more likely to switch away from the baseline if it's more diverse, but those are kind of really niche things that are hard to generalize. So what does all of this mean? What can we take away from it? Users used the feature. And then they experimented a little bit and they left it alone. Uh, so we, we did see some experimentations to usage. We do not have data yet on long-term user satisfaction. Uh, open question is, are users more satisfied with the system when they're able to do this kind of thing? Um, we observed a preference for personalized recommendations, especially SVD. Future work, disentangling the preference and naming. Um, which is, it's complicated when you're trying to do a study on something that's gonna be a production live system and also part of the point is transparency because you provide users with a lot of transparency and then that goes and messes with experiment design. Um, and so being able to do those kinds of studies and provide a lot of transparency can, is a tough, uh, a tough challenge. 
Also trying this kind of thing on, on more domains. We did it in movies, but what happens when you let the users have this kind of control of the recommendation, other applications, other domains, and then understanding the impact on the long-term user satisfaction and retention um, is, is also something that's very open future work. Um, and uh, discussion on Twitter this morning, I think some of this future work, uh, Dennis Para has already done some of it. Um, see the Twitter discussion for the link to that. And I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you for the presentation. I, I have more, more a suggestion than a question. It's about the naming uh, bias, uh, uh, as there is the, the strong risk that the behavior of users uh, is going to be influenced by the name, uh, names of the algorithms. So an experiment could be to use the same names, but to provide the same type of recommendations uh, for all the four uh, algorithms to see if the names introduce some biases in the behavior of users. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Another thing we could do is have something that has a little bit less, connect, like zero connection and randomly swap labels. So yes, you get the blue recommender and the green recommender, but different blue and green are different for different users. Um, and that's something where to run the study again, I think we would probably try to do, we would probably try to do something like that. Um, but yeah. I, uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. I have actually two questions. So the first question is, um, did, you use, uh, uh, did you use also some kind of engagement mechanism during the study period? The second question is actually, how long was your study period? Because I was wondering in terms of the familiarity of the users yeah, and this effect over time. Because you were just presenting, you know, uh, this over time, the mean, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so engagement, we do not do anything particularly with engagement, specifically with regards to this study. Um, we just rolled it out. Uh, well, we, we did uh, provide users with a... I'm trying to remember exactly what we did. Uh, we might have given users an announcement that there's that, it, that Movie Lens is now out of beta, but we did not do anything particularly to do engagement over the long term or, or particularly recruit users into it. It was just users that started up with the new system, we, we got them into this, and then we had that interstitial to explain the new feature. The study period was about four months. Uh, the details on the study period are in the paper, but basically, um, the, it ran from mid-November to end of March, I believe, and uh, end of March, April. And we only considered users uh, for, at least for a number of the analyses, we only considered users who started it a month, be who first used the new system a month before we stopped collecting data. Uh, one result, small, very small result that, that has a huge correlation causation problem that I didn't mention in the talk, is that users who were, uh, who used the knob, were more likely to come back again later um, but that has a very simple explanation of users who are more active users are more likely to play with new features. And so we don't, that's not yet evidence that this actually made the users come back. But, um, but that, the study period is about three to four months. The exact dates are in the paper. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mike. And thanks for mentioning our work, too. Uh, my question is if you had the chance to, to get also into some user characteristics, because the previous work of Bart, of uh, John O'Donohan, and my work too, uh, found a, a strong effect of, for instance, uh, what, what Chris mentioned, familiarity with the domain, familiarity with the tool, or um, even if you are a native speaker. So if, if, if you were able to get into some, like, personal characteristic that in addition maybe to this uh, uh, recommender algorithm could be influencing the, the results. So I did, we did look at some basic user characteristics. The ones I know we looked, or the ones uh, we did look at were uh, the user's age and time. 
uh, the user's age and number of ratings, which is going to capture a combination of system familiarity and domain familiarity if you, you assume that users who've rated a lot of movies know a lot about movies. Uh, neither of those things were predictive particularly of what recommender they would pick. So we didn't find like really established power users prefer SVD or anything like that, um, that it was a non-significant, uh, it, was a it was a statistically useless predictor for us in this particular setting with our users. There's a question here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> What's the same question? Other questions? Hi, uh, I'm up here. Uh, I'm kind of new to the field of recommender systems, so this is maybe uh, a naive question, but I'm wondering what the characteristics of these different recommendation algorithms are that means that a given user might consistently prefer one algorithm over another, even in like the best case scenario. Uh, so that is kind of the long-term agenda. Figure answering that question is one of the long-term agendas of this line of research. Um, we have some basic early results uh, with regards to, and we, we have some of, uh, for example, the, the SVD recommender was more likely to recommend less popular items. Um, and item item is an algorithm that is generally biased towards popularity. Um, just because popular movies are going to be similar to a lot of things because a lot of people have watched them and whatever other movie. Um, Diversity uh, is it, so the one the big ones we've been looking at so far are the popularity and the diversity, um, and, and using popularity as a proxy for novelty of the recommendations. And diversity for for our users, there was not a huge difference in the diversity of the recommendations. Item item was a little more diverse than SVD as far as the 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 the, 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 uh, the measurable diversity of the recommendations that it was producing. Uh, but those are the two kinds of properties we looked at. There may well be others, and we're very interested in figuring out what those are. But it's a long-term and difficult problem. But it's a very good question. Okay, we have time for one last question. I was Hi, uh, it's an interesting talk. Uh, my question is based on all these collaborative filters, they get better over time. So do you consider that, that fact in getting evaluating the results of the users? Um, so, can you say the last part of your question again? I mean, collaborative filters, they get better over time. So, do you consider that fact in your whole process? So, we tried to normalize for that a little bit by only taking established users. And yes, users are going to have different levels of history, but particularly, we did not run this experiment with any new users. And so all users had at least a minimum level of, uh, of uh, things into the system, and it's an established system, so that was relatively constant. We were not concerned with the change over time with this experiment. Um, but also the users, pre the, the number of ratings the user has, at least up to a certain number, is going to be one of the bigger things as far as building the history that's really going to help the collaborative filter make good recommendations for them. And we did not find any effects of the length of that history on the user's choice of algorithm. Um, so to the ex we, we mostly didn't consider it. To the extent that it came up in our analysis, uh, within the confines of established system, established users, we did not see uh, any effects of it. Um, but uh, it would be a very interesting question of, are different recommenders better for users at different stages in their lifetime? Just comparing between different users, we have not been able, at different lifetime stages, we have not been able to see such an effect. Uh, but it would be very interesting to try to see, is there a, a path of recommenders that kind of gives the user the best, the best uh, experience over the long term? Some of that's been tried with like the, the pick groups recommender trying to improve that early recommendation experience. But uh, the longer term, once you have enough data for the collaborative filter to work, um, is a very interesting uh, extension and future piece of future work to try to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Very last question. Hi, thank you for your presentation also. Uh, just a quick question. Users who actually switch the recommendation uh, method from the default to a different one, did that actually improve their CTR or uh, what was the result? Um, so the, uh, can, can you say, or 
something. Can you say again, I switched the conditions from which yeah. to which? Uh, from uh, users that actually switched from method A, from mm -hmm. recommendation method A to recommendation method B. Did they actually improve their results in terms of CTR of the uh, return recommendations or that uh, actually they didn't choose the best thing for them? So we, um, we have an additional set of, set of results in the paper that I did not get into at all because they're a little tricky to explain that look at something like that. It's not, I don't think it's exactly the thing you're looking for, but it looked at the relative. So rather than just looking at the diversity of the recommendations, look at the relative diversity. So we took the baseline as, the, as one, and then another algorithm was more than one, or was deviated from one if it was more or less diverse than the baseline. And we used that to try to predict user switching behavior. So are users more likely to switch if there is another algorithm that is more diverse or is more accurate? That also was not robustly useful as a predictor of user, of user behavior. So to the extent that we looked at that, the relative, uh, the relative differences between the algorithms, uh, we did not see any effects. Uh, but that's the, uh, for the analysis we did, that's the closest results that we have to, to answer your question, I think. Okay, thank you very much, you. Max. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Vikas. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Grooplands in the University of Minnesota. Uh, so, we had a very good presentation from Max and uh, uh, Michael about users in the loop or basically giving control to the users. In the morning, we heard about lean back users. So how about them? Actually, they are not going to do any of those tasks. So we have got it covered in the last presentation here, and we'll talk about it. <clears throat> so in this system, so uh, let me introduce my team. Uh, uh, Komal and myself worked on this paper along with my advisor, Joe and Lauren. Uh, Paul has given us some valuable psychological perspective. He is from the Department of Psychology in, uh, and Computer Science at University of Minnesota. So we heard a lot today about explore versus exploit dilemma. And we also heard like how there are lean back users and how there are uh, power users in the system. This presentation is going to take one step forward to understand and see if we can under, if you can interpret the user behavior from their recent consumptions and actually maybe tune that explore and exploit behavior. And that's why we have that I like to explore sometimes. We know that we all are probably explore, but we don't do the same kind of exploration every day. Sometimes you want to listen to a songs you may have listened one week back. Sometimes you want to listen to all new songs right on that day. <clears throat> So what we are going to talk about this in this paper is uh, users novelty preferences, that is how you seek new items actually vary. It varies over time. And we are going to see how we can predict those novelty preferences based on pa past consumption behavior. And then at the end, we'll see how we can actually make a recommender which is adaptive to those novelty seeking behavior of the users. So what are preferences? Uh, given this Rexis community, I guess everyone understands about it. Uh, however, it basically, just to mention it, uh, preferences determine how we make our everyday choices. Uh, yeah, everyone knows this. So what are novelty preferences? Novelty preferences det determine how well we appreciate new items. Am I the user who will appreciate new items every day? Or am I the user who will appreciate just leaving myself to the playlist I have generated, created, months or year back. <clears throat> so there are two kinds of users. One who will appreciate new items and will engage with it. And the other one who will keep distance from that new item, like cat with waters. <laughs> uh, so why we want to understand these novelty preferences? It's important to understand this because, as we were just talking about explore and exploit, is when someone is exploring and if I'm recommending the same old items, probably I'm going to make him bored board of the system and which will result into churning him out. That is, he will basically not come back to the system. The other behavior is if someone is exploiting, that is, he is pretty happy with whatever is recommended, he is pretty happy or with whatever is shown to, the, shown to him or her. And if we actually now recommend new items or introduce novelty, then basically we are keeping him frustrated and then again helping the system 
to let the user go, which is not a good thing. And this will only happen when you don't care about them and just throw the money here and there. Okay. Uh, so what are existing preference models? Well, like we have most of the collaborative filtering is what looks at is your interaction between an item and the user in a very static way that is your rating or an explicit feedback as in like how many times you have listened or all those things. But it never tried to understand what are the user consumption behavior. Did you consume 100 items in the same day or did you consume 100 items over a period of time? And those consumption behavior can be reflective of how basically maybe power user you are or lean back user you are or maybe even how exploring you are in the system. So what are the dynamic novelty preferences? We are talking here about three main important aspects and it's kind of intuitive with everyone. It's like not every user seek new items. There are people, we, we all have this playlist which we want to listen on our, uh, on the radio is like, not radio, the playlist that we want to listen every day. We don't want to change it. We just want to stick it. And we sometimes call it evergreen songs. Uh, however, there will be some users who will actually seek more. That is, they will actually keep exploring for new items. And even they do it sometimes. It's not necessary that if I have explored today, then I'll ex definitely explore tomorrow again. <clears throat> so, the objective here is, can we add value to user experience by understanding their changing need better? Uh, before moving ahead, let's uh, see what the data we have. So we use music data to understand this, to, uh, uh, to determine what is novelty seeking behavior within online interactions that has been logged in the two data sets that we have. One is from last.fm. And the another one is a sad cat. Sorry for that, because we have an NDA and we cannot disclose the name. Uh, now, why music? Why we chose the music data? The, the main reason is it has been it has been mentioned in various human behavioral sciences and psychological studies that music is one thing that users actually closely relate with their emotions and as well as their behavior. And it's easy to actually determine this behavior from the music data. And of course it was because it was available to us. And there's a low risk and cost of consumption for music. So if I'm exploring, I will actually go and explore new songs today. In movies, it is slightly difficult because of the time it consumes. <coughs> Some details about the data. We have for three months of last rate of M data, there are uh, around 882 valid users for our study. Uh, average number of session per user were 56 and Average session length, that is the number of items that in each session that user listened to the uh, songs were 39. Uh, to explain the session and everything, let's look at this figure. Uh, so how a user timeline looks, how our user timeline is generally like when we actually interact with any online system. So the green bars are the sessions. The length of the green bars are the session duration. Like sometimes we have Huge session, we engage a lot, we keep listening for hours and hours, some music. Sometimes we just listen to like probably 10 songs and just get off of it. The gap between the sessions are the gap that we have. Sometimes it is consistent, it is very close, we keep listening. One session may have been the morning, one session may be the afternoon. And suppose if you're traveling, then one session will be probably after two days or three days. Until unless you have an offline music uh, company with you. Uh, so we define two things out of this is we want to look at the user's current session here based on his recent consumption and that is what we are calling familiar set and we define a time window and in our in our analysis we define that as one week and I see at what the user has been consuming in last one week and we set the time window and we call that as a familiar set. Now the definition of that is basically all the items that user has consumed within last one week is let's call it familiar set. Then what is novel set? What are, how can I then determine like how many new items he has, he has been seeking? Is that new items in his recent familiar set that, has, that he consumed compared to his previous window, that is previous T minus one. So if, he, if my next session is, has 10 new items compared to a user who didn't change anything in the playlist, then probably I am seeking more. Uh, and hence, we define the novelty seeking score as simple as a ratio of all the new items in the familiar set, that in the current familiar set, 
by number of unique items in your familiar set. So we we were talking about this three agenda. So let's look at first one. That do they vary? Do the novelty seeking behavior that uh, users have do they vary vary over time? <clears throat> So the first thing we found is users do have different novelty preference. Now, what do I mean by saying that is not everyone in the system has same novelty seeking behavior. Someone seeks more, someone seeks less. And this distribution is a histogram of number of users with on X axis, we have novelty seeking is go from zero to one. Left is lower seeking, right is higher seeking. So we have some high as well as some low novelty seeking users. So these are like basically that a system which kind of if regards it as a constant novelty for the system will not work here because we have users with different seeking behavior. And we determined that scores do vary across the users with significant value and the standard deviation was greater than zero. The second part was do the same user have different or dynamic novelty preference over this period of time that is I myself do I have different seeking behavior over a period of time? So we looked at the user sessions and uh, multiple sessions and find out their s novelty seeking score. And we found out that there was a positive value. The deviation that is my seeking difference from my previous sessions were actually very different. And this deviation was positive and we found it to be significant. This kind of tells us that actually even each user seeking behavior is not consistent, it changes. So coming back to the second one, we learned that users do have different uh, varying uh, novelty seeking behavior. Each user themselves have a dynamic seeking behavior, but can we predict at the user level based on those past consumptions? So we build upon two intuitions. The, our two intuitions were that let's look at the diversity and let's look at the boredom. What is diversity? Is like, hey, if I'm listening to many songs, in my session, probably I'm seeking more because if I'm consuming 100 songs in my session of uh, three hours probably, then I'm definitely consuming more and seeking new items. But if I'm consuming 10 songs and kind of listening it again and again, then I am not seeking new items. Now, the second part is boredom. Boredom is, I if I'm listening to the same 10 songs again and again, probably I'll going to get bored over time and I will get into a seeking behavior soon. But if I have just changed my playlist, probably I will not get bored in soon enough and I'll, it will take some time to actually get satiated and get satisfied with that list and then start getting bored. So we defined this features as the diversity, the first one as if you have more items, then it's more diverse and we define it as the size of the familiar set that we just shown the figure and by the number of consumptions. The basically, the, uh, to understand this is if I have 10 songs in my playlist and I listen it 100 times in a day, then I'm less diverse than a user who may have 50 songs and like he listened 50 songs in a day. So he's kind of more diverse towards his song selection. What is boredom? Boredom is coming from a previous paper on which Komal worked. Uh, this is basically saying that, hey, if you are playing a particular item a lot, then you will get bored faster with that item. And if the gap between your plays is less, then again, you will get bored faster with that item. So we determine this as a dynamic item preference. And instead of that user and item static preference, we associate the dynamic item preference with the boredom. And basically what this concludes is like if you do place your songs more, one particular item and if there is a small gap between them, you are going to reach boredom fast with that song. We applied logistic regression model and uh, we tried to predict the novelty seeking score rather than determining from the data itself. And we use these features from the past that is diversity and boredom. And here are the results. We found that we were able to measure or predict novelty score uh, accurately and better than the constant novelty. That is if the system says that, hey, I'm going to show you four new items for every 10 items you are going to consume next, uh, we are going to recommend. Uh, in that way, we were able to determine better novelty seeking score for each of the recommendations. The second thing was the both features that diversity and boredom, we found it to be significant and positively correlated. That is higher diversity 
means that you are going to seek new items and higher boredom that if you are bored with the, your current session in your current session then you are again going to seek new items coming to the third point that how we can actually include these results from understanding this user behavior into a recommender so <coughs> it's easy to see that how the existing systems actually tries to recommend based on a combination of similar items that it finds and the new items that it has in the system and often is a, is a scenario that there is a lambda associated which is kind of a parameter constant across the system that hey we are going to introduce three new items for each 10 what we are trying to do is we are going to personalize that lambda and this lambda will be the novelty seeking score that we are trying to predict from your past consumption and hence we can determine that how many new items we need to introduce in your recommendation one way to understand let's consider uh, a set of familiar items that is uh, items that i already know about and let's consider a set of new items and if my novelty preference is high if it has been determined high then i'll probably recommend more new items and less of familiar items similarly if my novelty preference is low then i'll give you less of new items even though i have new items in the system uh, this is the design uh, it's hard to read there are many things uh, it's in the paper more detailed way but what it is showing is on the uh, left hand side uh, the leftmost block is basically the user consumption sessions that is coming into the central block which is a recommendation engine and where the uh, magic is happening and the right one is the current session that how am i going to adapt to your novelty seeking scores uh, for the evaluation of this adaptive novelty recommender that i just mentioned is we we compared it with certain baselines and there very some obvious baselines are one is item based collaborative filtering the second one is constant novelty that is that lambda is constant and i'm going to introduce some amount of novelty in your recommendations the third one is i'll always recommend you new items and the fourth one is i will always recommend you the same familiar items <coughs> we looked at two metrics uh, one is recommendation accuracy and another is novelty accuracy recommendation accuracy uh, looks at we use a cost sensitive weighted f measure to determine how well we are doing on recommendations and novelty accuracy is like if how basically understanding how our new items recommended what is the fraction of the new items recommended versus the new items actually you consumed <coughs> So this is the result. Uh, this is the weighted F measure that is the recommended uh, recommendation accuracy. What we see here is that pure F that is one with uh, all familiar items being recommended and the item based, they decline when you go from left to right. That is when the novelty seeking score is increasing. That is for users who are seeking more new items, actually your accuracy decreases. However, we found that adaptive novelty recommender that the adanov r in short is is performing comparable to the best baseline for all the novelty seeking scores that is on the left side it is able to perform close with item based collaborative filtering and on the right side that is when the seeking score is pretty high it is it is able to perform closely with the pure n that is hey all new items to you because you are seeking too many new items uh looking at novelty accuracy that is the fraction of new items actually introduced compared to the fraction of new items you consumed uh, we look at that adaptive novelty uh, adanov r is capable to adapt uh, across the different seeking behaviors of the user and for for on the low side when the seeking score is low it is showing lesser items on the right side uh, when the seeking score is high it is introducing more items uh, on the top and the bottom that is one on the red line and one on the bottom are the pure n and pure f that is hey i'm going to introduce all the new items that is the top one and pure f is the bottom the green one item based collaborative filtering is doing marginally low here so what are the key takeaways in this uh, we see that novelty preference are dynamic they are not dynamic not only across the users but within users so it is important to understand that my own preferences towards new item can change i may seek new items today i may not seek it today uh, 
The second important point is the past consumption behavior that we'll, when you look at diversity and boredom for the items that you are interacting with, it provided enough significant signal to predict future novelty preferences. And we also show that the, a recommender is capable to adapt to this novelty seeking preferences. Uh, in conclusion, we, uh, we want to say that if we want to model novelty preference dynamics, it's important and it's, it can significantly impact the recommendation design. And it's important given that uh, what we heard in the morning sessions that there may be millions and millions of lean back users and we need to understand them. We need to understand their behavior also because they are important to the system as the power users. Uh, and of course, given that, we want to actually in the future work, we are trying to study that what will be the effect on retention if we actually conduct this adaptive recommendation in online users. Uh, thanks. Uh, this work is supported by the grants mentioned there and I am good for questions. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Um, well, thank you for your presentation. So my question is, uh, is the preference novelty uh, is context uh, dependent? For example, the, the, those users uh, during, for example, weekend prefer to have uh, novel uh, music or uh, something like that. So, uh, sorry, I didn't got the question. Can you is the, is the novelty preference is context dependent or just oh. it, is it just dependent on the boredom and uh, diversity? No, you, you, you actually perfectly got the point where we want to move next. <laughs> so context is definitely one very important thing for recommendations. And if we can understand the context, then we will probably actually disentangle more into like when you get diverse. So the when part will be more clear. Like if, for example, like if I get the context that if you're in gym at certain point of time, you're probably going to not explore anything new and you're going to just listen to what you may have in the playlist. Well, then when you pray on radio, I'll just make sure that you listen to what actually you have been listening to. So context will play an important role. Yes, but here we didn't look at that part. Yep. There's a question here. Uh. Okay, I'll go here first because I can see him. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you for the presentation. And I have a question about your data set. Uh, when you computed the uh, preference for novelty for users, mm -hmm. did you consider that last FM data set mixed together scrabbles coming from the fact the user decided to play a song uh, together with scrabbles coming from the last FM recommender systems? Be because this can affect, uh, I think, your results. Yes, uh, you are right, and in fact, we so. Given that last.fm doesn't mention that which of the users and what are the song sequences are actually coming from radio or what are the exactly. sequences are coming from playlist, the other data is actually from own user selection. So, okay. and since we saw the same results, we were sure that, okay, it's not related and we can actually disentangle and say that, that this is true in the other data set as well as the data which is sure that it is coming from streaming and streaming as in like playlist, not from a radio. Because the, the composition uh, is similar in terms of uh, preferences of novelty uh, among the yes, two data sets. Yes, okay. yes. That's why we had the two data sets, thank, actually. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Uh, so, question is, how did we uh, like uh, considered what was the time of the session? Like one week? How did we decide that? So, I, I didn't heard the whole. Okay, yeah. So we we played with one week, two weeks. So we had three months data. So w what we played with is like one week, two weeks, as well as a month. And we saw that the same behavior was there, that is novelty preferences was what different among the users. However, we chose the one week because it kind of make more sense. It's like every Friday, like it, it's just more intuitive that, okay, a week kind of songs, we choose what we are going to do on Monday. And then after the week, probably you will change something in your playlist. 
So that's why we just stick to one week. However, we actually validated the data for two weeks as well as one month and in the other data set also. Hi, I, um, I noticed that in your definition of similarity or um, diversity, you have the number of distinct items divided by the number of total items, but that doesn't account for any, anything about whether those items are self-similar to each other, right? So in the case where you have, I've listened to 100 Led Zeppelin songs, um, there, that would be considered no diversity. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that's something that would um, be a shortcoming of your system. Yep. Uh, that's a good question. And I, the, so the way it is kind of we are looking at the new items is basically in music what happens or like even food is repetition is very important. Like you actually do repeat music, you do repeat restaurants and those kind of like this, that kind of consumption. You may not repeat movies often. And when repetition is important, then anything you may have forgotten, like beyond your familiar set, that is the time window we have set. Uh, we say that it's kind of new for you. And since repetition in music and along with your forget forgetfulness about the items that you have consumed, we say that any item that is not within the familiar set is the new item. Now, definitely there is this context of similarity between those items and not. Uh, we also looked at the artist level data that is in the paper we have mentioned that. Uh, so song items as well as the song artist and we found the same. So it may happen that all the 100 items may be coming from the same artist and that may not be as diverse as listening to 100 artists actually. So we found that the novelty seeking score and the variation and the results were both same at the items as well as artist level. Okay, we have time for the very last question. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Actually, t when talking about novelty and uh, when your aim is like to have like pure novel things for the users, there might be a risk that users uh, lose their trust because you know sometimes users trust more when they see also familiar things in between. So um, yeah, that m would be also nice to consider this uh, trade-off into account when you are doing your, your research. That um, how 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 it is correlated, you know, users trust your recommendation and how much it's good to you know provide them with novel uh, items. Uh, so I heard your last part, but missed the first part. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean that this is also something nice to be considered in your research because it's also important how much users trust in recommendations that we provided with Correct. them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you just provide them with uh, very novel things, maybe they lose their trust, you know, because sometimes you feel more uh, re like comfortable when you see some familiar things in between. So this is also an issue that uh, might be nice to be considered. <laughs> yes, and uh, I guess an online user study, and if I guess that what you're saying is like, uh, how do users will trust the recommendation given whatever the novelty. So I guess uh, it's more important for this kind of study to definitely go and do an online study with real users, and definitely that is kind of the thing, I guess any kind of this research next step would be. Uh, however, we don't have access to such kind of system as well as data, so we cannot answer that. Uh, but yeah, it will be definitely interesting to see the trust as well as if retention and all those things th can be impacted by looking that, okay, if I adjust the novelty to you, then does those things impact your results on the recommendation? So this closes the session, so thank you very much, uh, thank Vikas, you. and thank you very much for attending.